So I would imagine that the church year calendar was put together by people who live in the Northern Hemisphere. I suggest that because, first of all, Christianity sort of has its birth in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, Israel, uh, Holy Land is in the Northern Hemisphere. And also it first spread into Europe and in Asia in the Northern Hemisphere. So it's kind of natural that we would follow the rhythms of the Northern Hemisphere. And by that I mean that as we get into the end of the church year, remember the church year begins with the first Sunday in Advent. So we're, we're rapidly reaching that end of the church year, the lessons for our Sunday worship sort of talk about the end of things, not just the end of the church year, but the end of things in general. And, you know, I often wonder, side, little side note, you know, what do people in Australia and New Zealand do with the church year? Because they're just entering spring, you know? Um, do they sing, I'm dreaming of a bright Christmas? Because that's in the middle of their summer. I'll have to find out. Um, anyway, getting back to us, we, I don't know, um, as we have all these scriptures talking about doom and gloom, Jesus talks about the destruction of Jerusalem, Malachi talks about the arrogant and the wicked being burned like stubble and having no hope left that, that they'd be like ash on the ground. Those are scary images. And as we hear them, as you and I hear them, at least and when I hear them, especially when I was, was younger, I would, like Eric mentioned, be kind of a little bit concerned. Hear, hear Jesus talk about nations shall rise against nation, and there'll be pestilence, and there will be um, famine, and there will be all kinds of persecution. That just sounds really scary. And I think about the people that heard these words first from Malachi. Malachi, we really don't know when he had his career as a prophet, time-wise. We know that it was after Zechariah. Um, Zechariah prophesies after God's people return from exile in Babylon. So we're talking about the, um, five, the, the, the end of the 6th century, the beginning of the 5th fifth, fifth century B.C. Remember, as we go B.C., we count down to zero. And during that time period, I kind of did a little bit of research and, and wondered, well, what were they facing back then? What were, what were the people of God facing? Well, Babylon was long gone. Uh, the Babylonians had already come in and destroyed Jerusalem, as Jeremiah had prophesied. The people spent 70 years in Babylon and now had returned to Jerusalem to find it still in ruins, to find the difficulties of life. Uh, the vineyards had all gone to seed. The, the orchards had all um, gone wild. The crop plants needed to be reclaimed. So there was hard work uh, back in, in, in Judah. There was hard work back rebuilding Jerusalem. And for those who not, weren't necessarily in Jerusalem but still living in where Babylon had been, now they were under Persia. And the king of Persia, he, he called himself the king of kings, um, was Cyrus, and Cyrus was God's servant to bring God's people back to Jerusalem, but Cyrus was gone, and Xerxes had come to power. And you may not know Xerxes by his name unless you're fond of uh, movies about Greek soldiers, but Xerxes is known as Ahasuerus, in the Old Testament book of Esther. And if you know the story of Esther, you know that there were people in Persia, Haman among them. Haman plotted to get the king of Persia to order the Jews to be exterminated. So God's people were living in difficult times back then. There were, there were people in government, in the empire, that wanted them destroyed. They themselves that had returned to Jerusalem found the place a difficult place, found hardship, found difficulty, found enemies now around Jerusalem, not the peaceable kingdom in which they had lived before. And much worse, there was no son of David on their throne. They didn't have a king except for the king of Persia. The king of Persia approved their governor. The king of Persia approved whatever they did. They were under foreign domination. They were feeling oppressed. They were feeling 
at risk. They were feeling trapped. They were feeling perhaps like you and I sometimes do living in our days. You know, I sometimes think that when we hear the news, all the things going on, because nations are still rising against nation. There are still stories of pestilence out there, plagues. There are still famines. The people at risk of starvation seem to grow every day. And sometimes I think we just want to gather the wagons in a circle and just hunker down and let the world do its thing and go where it's going, and we'll just hunker down. You know, get all the Christians together and just gather them and let us feel safe. Let us feel protected. Let us feel good about ourselves and let the world go its way because it just seems so scary out there. Especially when we hear Malachi this morning. He talks about the arrogant, the, the proud, the, the wicked being burned like stubble. That sounds kind of like the old commercials during the Barry Goldwater campaign of nuclear war. That sounds like something really scary. So let's just get our wagons in a circle and hunker down and be safe among ourselves. But listen to the rest of what Malachi says. Malachi isn't talking to God's people about how they should be afraid. Rather, Malachi talks to them about rejoicing in the, in the coming of the rising sun, in the coming dawn, when they would find healing in the wings of the sun. He's talking about them being, as Eric gave you pictures, about being like calves that leap and gamble, G-A-M-B-O-L, for joy. So, what does that have to do with us? I mean, the last time I saw a cow was at my mom's uncle's farm. So I was probably eight. And the only cows that I saw were locked into stanchions. And there were milking machines on that, their udders. And they were being milked by a machine. So... I'm sure once that cow got out of there, she was jumping for joy because that was not a pleasant appearance. But what do we have to do with cows? How are cows like us? Have you ever felt like you were stuck in a stall? Maybe. I began to think in my mind, what in my experience would be like a calf stuck in his stall or her stall for the entire winter? And... I remembered Wisconsin. I'm kind of glad to live in Portland because the snow here is mostly water. Mostly comes as rain. And I'll take rain over 18 inches of snow any day. But I remember a winter. I think it was 1976, 77, or it could have been 77, 78. Um, that winter, that January, I was in college in the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So... That January, as I recall, it didn't get above zero. It may not have even gotten above 10 below for the entire month. You could, you know, your breath, it wasn't a matter of seeing your breath. As you exhaled, it froze and fell on the ground. It was that kind of cold. You could walk across all the five lakes in Madison, Wisconsin, because they were frozen solid. In fact, people who lived across the lake were walking or snowmobiling across the lake. It was so cold. We just wanted to stay in our houses, in our rooms, in our apartments. It was so cold. And then the first weekend in February, it got to 40 degrees. 40 degrees. A whole 50 degrees warmer. You would have thought it was 4th of July. Everyone was walking around in shorts. The, the sorority girls were in their swimsuits on their chase lounges on the porches of their sororities. Everyone was acting like it was summer. Everyone was, was happy. They were just excited. They were, they were free of winter's cold. I thought that's probably what Malachi is envisioning. So free from what, 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 what in our lives, what in your life and mine is, would be like that, that month of January where we were trapped or we were stuck. We were, we were in our rooms, in our places. We couldn't, didn't want to go anywhere. What would be like the, the stall that keeps 
a calf or keeps a lamb inside all time. And I thought, well, maybe going back to the end of the church here, the end of the end of the world, maybe fear is our stall. Fear, fear of those things out in the world. I mean, just read the newspaper, watch your favorite um, news program, either on the internet or on TV. And all those stories, all those news stories about nations rising against nation, about new plagues that are being discovered and infecting certain parts of the world. All of that stuff just seems to hit like a tsunami, doesn't it, sometimes? And just knock you down because it's just so unsettling. It can be so, so frightening because we as human beings are limited. All we know is what's happening right now. We can think we're planning about tomorrow. We can think we've, we've handled yesterday, but we're really just living in this moment. Anything beyond this moment is just sometimes overwhelming. And so that fear of what's happening next, that fear of what's coming down the road, that fear of tomorrow can just want to make us stop and sit down and just be happy with the little stall. At least we're safe in our stall. The world out there can't get us if we're safe in our room. But sometimes that room can be, as the song goes, safe within our room, safe within our tomb. We touch no one and no one touches us, as Simon and Garfunkel sang. Fear can be like a stall. But that fear can be more than just the fear of what's happening out there in the world. It can be a fear of God. Because when you hear Malachi talk about the law that Moses gave, that God gave Moses on Mount Horeb, then we're reminded of all those thou shalt's and thou shalt nots. All of those, those words from God that act like a mirror as he shows us what we should be doing. And when we measure ourselves against that word, we find out that we've fallen short. We find out that we've, we've missed. And there's this thing in human beings. We call it sin. We can call it pride. We can call it selfishness. We can call it self-centeredness. Call it what you like. It still is this tendency that we have to look at ourselves and say, well, I'm doing pretty good. I'm a good person. I'm, I'm just doing fine in my stall. And say to God in his word, I'm not going to listen to your word, God, because um, I don't like what it says to me, what it says about me. So I'm just going to ignore you. I'm going to ignore, ignore, ignore your word. And Malachi calls that way of living, Malachi calls that way of thinking, arrogance. He talks about the arrogant being destroyed. He talks about the wicked being destroyed. Now, when you hear arrogant, you know, there might be certain people you think of, but you probably don't think of yourself. And when you think of the wicked, there's probably a long list of people you could add on that list, but you probably wouldn't add yourself. Well, whether you're not people that admit that God is God and that his word is his word, it's to, he still is God and he still speaks his word of judgment. And that word of judgment can leave you and me feeling very much afraid of God because we, can, we fear his punishment. And that fear of God, that fear of his punishment can be like that stall that the, the calf is stuck in. It can be like the stanchions that hold the cow from moving because that fear of God can just be immobilizing. That we don't even want to say his name. We don't want to acknowledge him. We just want to hide away from his wrath. But there's more. God doesn't leave us in that stall. God doesn't leave us in our fear. God doesn't leave us afraid of him. God made some promises. And those promises were kept because the son of righteousness that Malachi promised arose. You know, Isaiah starts the story about the sun. We, you know, people say it's always darkest before the dawn. You know, it's not really. That twilight that kind of lasts 
between, well, now in the fall, it kind of lasts between maybe quarter to five and quarter after seven. That kind of twilight where this, it's, it's a little bit light, but you're kind of wondering what kind of day it's going to be, what, what's coming next. We live in that twilight. God's people lived in that twilight when Isaiah spoke the words of promise that those people who live in darkness would see a great light. The land of Zebulun and Naphtali, they would see a new day dawn. And Malachi echoes that promise as he talks about the son of righteousness that would, that would, be, that would, ri- that would rise, Jesus. These promises of the son of righteousness, these promises of the light dawning, these promises of the day of the Lord, in fact, were all brought clear, brought together in Jesus. That baby born in the manger in Bethlehem is that rising sun. That baby born in the manger in Bethlehem, the one that came to be God with us. He's the rising sun, the sun of righteousness. He's the one who comes to set us free. He's the one who comes to take the place, our place, your place, and mine. You know, we're the arrogant, we're the wicked who deserve to be scorched by his light. And when we're on the outside, when we're on the lost side of his word, that's what it feels like. Those words of judgment, that fear of being judged by God. But that judgment, that wrath of God that Malachi describes, scorching the wicked and destroying the arrogant, that wrath of God was poured out on Jesus on Good Friday. That day of the Lord began on Good Friday as Jesus took upon himself the cross, the nails that you and I deserved. He shed his blood on the altar of that cross so that we could be forgiven. He died the death that you and I deserve. He died in our place. He was destroyed as the arrogant for us who are arrogant. He was was scorched as the wicked for we who are wicked in our place. The grave that he was laid in is the grave you and I deserve. He took it all for us in our place. The son of righteousness. And he didn't stay dead. But on Easter, the son of righteousness rose again with healing in his wings. I remember back in my youth when I was five or six, my grandparents gave us a picture Bible. Maybe you had a picture Bible too. This was a big, big thing about this big. And it had full color drawings inside. And they were beautiful. I remember the one of the Garden of Eden. There was Adam and Eve in their um, garden, surrounded by all the animals, lions and tigers, um, cows and deer. Everybody was at peace as they were sitting in this garden under the white puffy clouds. And the sun was shining through those clouds like you see there. And I remember thinking, that's what God's blessings look like, those beams of sun. And so for me, when... Malachi talks about the right, son of righteousness right, right being, being raised with healing in his wings, healing in his beams. That's the kind of picture I think of those, these beams of God's grace, these beams of God's love, these beams of God's presence shining down on us. And it reminds me, back when we lived in El Paso, Texas, my parents would come down to visit right around Easter time. They'd come in the fall also, but they'd come at Easter for two reasons. One, it, it was nice in the, out. It was Easter time. They wanted to celebrate Easter with us, and it wasn't going to be 115 yet. And so they would leave the winter in Wisconsin, and they would come down to El Paso. And where would we find them most of the time? They'd be out laying on our chase lounges in the sun, just enjoying the warmth of the sun, just enjoying, letting this, the sunlight just warm up their co- tired and cold bodies that had weathered the winter in Wisconsin. And I think that's a picture of what it looks like spiritually as Jesus shines on us, 
his love, his forgiveness, his mercy. When Jesus shines on us, raising us to live that new life, taking us out of the winter of our fear, the winter of our being trapped by our sin, and bringing us into the light of his love, of his mercy, the warmth of his presence as he shines, as he brings that healing into us, as he forgives our sins so that we can respond as my parents did to the son with joy, as we can be like those galloping calves that Eric showed before, these ones now set free, You and I don't have to be afraid of death. You and I don't have to be afraid of God's punishment, God's wrath. You you and I don't have to say, oh gosh, this is coming on me because I did X, Y, Z when I was in high school. God is punishing me now. That's not a thing. God carried out his punishment on Jesus for us in our place. So you don't ever have to be wondering whether God loves you, whether God is with you. Because the son of righteousness has, has been raised and you have healing in his wings, in his beings. You are loved. You are forgiven, set free from the punishment of your sin. You don't have to worry about the law side of God's love killing you because the love side of God's word has given you life, has given you freedom, has given you forgiveness so that there's reason for joy reason for joy each day as we live in this world. I mentioned all of the, the, th- the things that we're afraid of in the newspaper. You know, it seems like Christianity is losing ground in the world. It seems every time you pick up the newspaper or hear from relatives, the churches are closing right and left across the country. Good news is that for every church that closes, the statistics say two to three churches are founded and open their doors as those churches close. The gospel is exploding across Africa and across Asia in South America. People are streaming miles, walking miles just to go to church in places like Tanzania and Namibia. People are, the gospel is drawing people. Jesus is drawing more people into his light, into his warmth, into his love. Christianity is not dying. It is thriving in this dark world of ours. And the picture I showed you of the wagons in a circle, that's emigrant rock in Nebraska. It's on the Oregon Trail. It's one of the first landmarks people run into as they left Independence, Missouri. Scott's Bluff was the next landmark that they looked for. But emigrant rock, people carved their names into that rock. And long ago, one of the first settlers carved a big cross into that rock to remind them that as they went on their journey, they went there with Jesus. That rock became kind of a symbol for the church, right? Because all those names carved into a rock, carved into the rock that had, that stood under the cross. That's where we live. Our names are carved into the stone of God's love, of God's mercy. The rock of his love, the rock who is Christ. He knows us. He knows you and me by name. So that when you find yourself in those scary places, when you find yourself in those overwhelming moments, when you find yourself in those moments, those days, those weeks that just seem like that stall that holds you captive, remember that you are not captive. You are claimed as a beloved son or daughter of God in Jesus Christ. You are forgiven. You are na- your name is known. <laughs> you and I are set free <clears throat> to live as God's people, to live in joy. Amen. <clears throat> and now may the peace that passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds in true faith in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.